You're listening to The Unsafe Bible with Pastor Ken Brown. I don't plant corn and say, well, why do I not have broccoli coming up here? It's because I know I can kill broccoli just like that. You know, I'm not even going to try growing that. Not the only thing I can successfully grow is okra. But here in Isaiah, we see a con- that concept being presented. The Lord re- loves to reward those who walk in His paths. I mean, He does. And if we're following Him and doing what He, what he asks, he, 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 just, he loves to reward us. We're His kids, and He wants to. Pastor Ken illustrates in his message today what happens when followers of Jesus do just that. Follow him in words, thoughts, and actions. In the book of Isaiah, Israel needed to trust and accept what God was telling them, making changes where necessary. Because if not, the nations of Judah and Israel were headed for hard, hard times, for a complete undoing of their way of life. With repentant hearts, they needed to turn back to God. What do we need to change today in our personal lives and in our nation? Well, let's join Pastor Ken in the book of Isaiah, chapter 3, as he continues his message, Why Regime Change is Needed. They're rebelling against the fact that the presence of Yahweh is visibly in the temple, and it's characteristic of man. That's the way we are. We rebel against God. And it's going to happen again at the end of the millennial reign of Messiah, Stop and think about that. When we studied the book of Revelation, we get to Revelation 20, verse 6. And it says, all the nations of the world, this is after 1,000 years of Jesus Christ on the throne, 1,000 years of peace, people living to the ages of 8, 900 years of age, no disease, no illness, nothing, and the nations of the world gather together to destroy Israel and to destroy Yahweh. And it doesn't end well for any of them. Just kind of like, they're done. Anyway. One of the first things Jesus addressed at the beginning of his ministry is where Judah and Jerusalem has failed. Now remember, they're supposed to be reflecting Yahweh to the world. That's what their job is, and they're not doing it. Jesus talked about that, and he called it salt and light. And when he's still talking about the kingdom back in Matthew chapter 5, he's telling, this is still the same expectation. It hasn't changed. You're the salt of the earth. He's telling the, the nation of Israel this. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything, except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You're the light of the world. And he's again talking to all the Jews. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. You never know who's watching you. You never know. I've had people when I was working in the regular world, I would have people come into my office. I had never had a chance to tell them that I was a believer and didn't have a chance to share with them. But they had watched me for several years and they walk in, close the door and say, I need to talk to you about the Lord. And you're kind of like, where did you pick up that it's safe to talk to me about that? Well, it's just the way you live. I don't hear you curse. I don't hear you. I don't hear this. I don't... The way that we live is a way that points people to Jesus Christ. I'm not saying that to brag. I'm just saying that's how we point people that we don't even know. They're watching us. They want to know how we're going to react and what we're going to do. They just do. That's what Jesus is talking about. The nation of Israel wasn't doing that. And Isaiah is saying that too. They're not doing that. Jerusalem and Judah no longer reflect believing loyalty in Yahweh. They don't. Isaiah sees this as a sin that is compounded because it's not an occasional breach He says their face is showing it. It's an unabashed way of life. It is a lifestyle. Verse 9, the expression of their faces bears witness against them. They display their sin like Sodom. That's an interesting comparative. They do not even conceal it. Woe to them, for they've brought evil on themselves. This is the second time Isaiah compares Jerusalem to Sodom. The city of Sodom had a lot of things going against it. Remember? I mean... But the number one thing that Yahweh talked about was the arrogance of their sin. The fact that they were proud of what they were doing. They were proud of their alternative lifestyle. They were proud of the the fact that they had that and that they were trying to share it with everybody. And if you came in, they would do everything they could to pervert you too. 
Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 48 to 50, as I live, declares the Lord God, Sodom, your sister and her daughters, have not done as you and your daughters have done. Behold, this is the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had arrogance, abundant food and careless ease, but she did not help the poor and needy. They were haughty and committed abominations before me, therefore I removed them when I saw it. And what God is saying in Ezekiel and what he's saying in Isaiah is, you're worse than them. I wonder what he'd be saying to our culture today. Much worse than them. Yeah. The citizens of Jerusalem were proud of, they're proud of their alternative lifestyle. They had come out of the closet about their worship of Molech and their worship of Baal. And under Ahaz, they'll really come out of the closet. They were proud of their new freedom to live life as they choose. They were proud of their alternative lifestyle to having to be a faithful Yahweh follower. They could still turn to Yahweh if things got bad, but they could go worship their own gods and do whatever they wanted to, right? The worship of Molech was having their own children killed by passing them through the fire to Molech. And Baal worship involved male and female prostitution, and that was how they raised money and how they worshiped their god, how they worshiped Baal. So between infanticide and prostitution and sexual immorality, Israel thought they had everything wired. They thought everything was going well. Does this sound vaguely familiar? It sounds like our culture today, doesn't it? That's why you know, we really need to pray that the Lord pour out His Spirit and we see His Spirit pour forth on this nation and we see revival break out. Revival means the believers coming back to the Lord, but we need to see those who don't know Jesus come to know Jesus. There's a certain pride in living an alternative lifestyle versus one that's based on a biblical worldview. And in fact, the biblical worldview is actually becoming hazardous and unsafe these days, which is why I'm going to continue to do it. I'm a bit of a rebel. The pastor of Calvary Chapel, Santa Barbara, says this, one of the most destructive lies of our time is that it's wrong or hypocritical to have a standard we don't live up to. No one has always told the truth, yet it's right and good to teach our children don't lie, Right? It would be wrong and destructive for someone to answer, you can't tell your child not to lie. You've lied in the past, you're a hypocrite. This attitude in our society translates into a certain result, a wholesale lowering of standards. That's what was going on in Judah too, by the way. Also, the charge of hypocrisy is false. It's not hypocritical to promote a standard you don't perfectly meet. Hypocrisy is when you pretend to keep the standard that you don't, or you think it's fine for you not to keep the standard when you think others should. Like I always tell people when I invite them to church, and they say, well, there's a lot of hypocrites there. I say, hey, come on in. We could use one more. Join us, because we all are. You know, that's just, we're, sin we're sinners, saved by grace. Isaiah chapter 3, verse 10. Say to the righteous, it'll go well with them. They'll eat the fruit of their actions. Yahweh makes a couple of aside comments with all this judgment going on. He's saying those who are faithful to Yahweh will be taken care of. Guess who winds up showing up in Babylon captive? Daniel, his friends, Ezekiel, other believers show up there. And when they are finally released 70 years later, only 40,000 come back. There's a couple hundred thousand there, but only 40,000 come back. For those who have taken his offer of settlement seriously in chapter 1 and listened to what he told Solomon, they're going to enjoy the fruit of their actions. In other words, they're going to be able to enjoy the fact that they've been faithful to Yahweh, they're going to have that future that we talked about. They're not going to have this thing called the great white throne. They're not going to be going to Sheol, the bad side. They're going to be going to the good side. They're going to be going to Abraham's bosom, which is, by the way, empty now. That whole side was emptied when Jesus Christ rose from the dead. While the rest of the world is running full speed in the same direction on a broad road, those of us who have chosen to walk on the narrow path that Jesus discussed will see the result of the faithfulness in our lives and after. Here in Isaiah, we see being presented a concept that tracks through the entire Bible. Jesus talked about it too. And it's a simple concept. It's called sowing and reaping. You get what you sow. If you sow corn, you're going to reap corn. I have tried to grow corn, and I reap dead plants because I don't have a green thumb. But when I can successfully grow something, I get corn. I don't plant corn and say, well, why do I not have broccoli coming up here? It's because I know I can kill broccoli just like that. You know, I'm not even going to try growing that. About the only thing I can successfully grow is okra. But here in Isaiah, we see a con that concept being presented. The Lord re loves to reward those who walk in His paths. I mean, He does. 
and if we're following him and doing what he what he asks, he 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 just he loves to reward us. We're his kids, and he wants to. There are exceptions, but that's I mean, if we we reap what we sow. That's this concept of sowing and reaping. It's a natural law. It's used in agriculture all the time, but it's also a spiritual law too. It shows up. That's what's being talked here. If the nation of Israel will repent, they're going to reap. They're going to reap what they sow. They're going to reap righteousness. They're going to have a great nation under Hezekiah. There's revival. The nation begins to experience that again. He protects them miraculously from the Assyrian army. All this will happen. The principle works positively, but it also works negatively. You have the Proverbs eleven eighteen: the one who sows righteousness reaps a sure reward. But then there's Proverbs twenty two eight: whoever sows injustice reaps calamity. Hosea kind of expanded on this, and then Paul gave us additional guidance. But in Hosea chapter 10, verses 12 and 13, sow with a view to righteousness. Reap in accordance with kindness, and break up your fallow ground, for it's time to seek the Lord until He comes to rain righteousness on you. You've plowed wickedness, and you've reaped injustice, and you've eaten the fruit of lies, because you've trusted in your way and in your numerous warriors. Again, he's talking about the same thing. You're trusting in men. You're not trusting in the Lord. Paul took this same principle and used it in his discussion in Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 to 10. Do not be deceived. God's knock knocked. For whatever a man sows, he'll also reap. The one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let us not lose heart in doing good. For in due time we'll reap if we do not grow weary. So then while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Isaiah is letting those who remain faithful or become faithful that despite what they see going on around them, Yahweh is in control and they're going to be recipients of a much better future. Those who were faithful would see the things that that would dismay them. And I mean, they're going to be like Habakkuk. They're going to say, Lord, why are you letting all this happen? Uh, But Yahweh's response will show up elsewhere in the New Testament. In Habakkuk 1, 12 and 13, Lord, you've been active from the ancient times. My sovereign God, you're immortal. Lord, you've made them your instrument of judgment, talking about the Babylonians. Protector, you've appointed them as your instrument of punishment. You are too just to tolerate evil. You are unable to condone wrongdoing. So why do you put up with such treacherous people? Why do you say nothing when the wicked devour those who are more righteous than they are? That was Habakkuk's question. And God tells him, I'm using them to judge those who are wicked. Yahweh's response answers all those questions that we would have as a result of the quandaries of seeing evil in our culture, And then we get to chapter 2 of Habakkuk, verses 2 to 4. The Lord responds, write down this message, record it legibly on tablets, so the one who announces it may read it easily, for the message is a witness to what is decreed. It gives reliable testimony about how matters will turn out. Even if the message is not fulfilled right away, wait patiently, for it will certainly come to pass. It will not arrive late. Look, the one who desires, whose desires are not upright, will faint from exhaustion, but the person of integrity will live because of his faithfulness. Or it might be more familiar, the righteous will live by faith. And that's repeated three times by Paul in the New Testament. He repeats it in Romans 1.17, Galatians 3.11, and in Hebrews 10.38, if you say that Paul wrote Hebrews. Otherwise, the author of Hebrews repeated it. But what's the other half of this concept being enumerated by Isaiah? What about the wicked? In verse 11, he says, woe to the wicked. It'll go badly with him. For what he deserves will be done to him. I can't be much more forward than that. I mean, you know, that's pretty up there. Isaiah is not, there's, you know, these are two side comments that God's making to these two groups, and something else is being set up as well. There's going to be a believing remnant that's going to serve the Lord. There just will be. The evil that comes upon the wicked is that which they've earned and merited, and, and that's what's due to them. We ran into that over and over again in the book of Revelation. We see all those judgments. We're going, that's horrible. And then, then we see God says, well, they, that's, all they, that's all they're due. That's what they're owed because of, what, of, because of the way they live. So, you know, we're seeing there's a note of anguish about the evil, but we also see there's still this opportunity for repentance and the results of what it is. So sowing and reaping, you know, we're seeing it right here. Verse 12, O oh my people, Their oppressors are children, and women rule over them, O my people. Those who guide you lead you astray and confuse the direction of your paths. This is not a diatribe against women in leadership, okay? That's not what he's saying. He goes back to his people and he says, once again, there's a leadership problem. 
the prophet is saying in one sense Judah is already being ruled by those who are incompetent to do so. In that day and age, many women were not competent to lead, they were not competent to rule because they were kept in the house and never taught anything. The very persons who should show them the right way, who also should be their, their mothers, their, their wives, aren't. Because I immediately think of Proverbs 31 and, and how the, the, the righteous woman is busy serving and busy doing things to make her husband serve even better in the community. We discussed earlier the ages of the kings of Judah post Uzziah. And when you stop and think about that, who's influencing these young kings? Their mothers. Who's really ruling in some of these cases? Their mothers. That's who's ruling. That's what he's saying. You're going to have kings so young, their mothers are going to wind up ruling. And that didn't go well the one time it did happen in Jewish history. In his day, women did not have the educational advantages that men enjoyed. So they were less fit to lead, as they thought, during, than men. But that didn't stop God from using Deborah. That didn't stop God from doing a lot of things that he did using women who were able to step up and serve the Lord when the men were all a bunch of losers. And that does happen. But children, because of their age, lack the experience, perspective, and wisdom needed to lead adults, so their mothers were helping them. So you had unqualified, uncalled leaders who were leading even though they weren't officially in control. That's what he's talking about. Because of the ages of those who were becoming king, there was a recognition of the influences that their mothers were having on the first few years of rule. And Solomon even had that problem in 1 Kings 2.19. You know, Bathsheba went to King Solomon to speak to him for Adonijah. And the king arose and bowed before her and set her on his throne. And he had a throne set up for her and sat on her right, on his right. And then, of course, she asked him something and he said, no, go kill Adonijah. So I mean, he, he told mother, no, we're not going to do what you would like to do. But it appears that there was an influence that we don't understand. It was a lot heavier with the younger kings. And we need to understand that these eastern kings, who, because they were not fully faithful to Yahweh, they're supposed to have one wife, but they were eastern kings. And what did a good eastern king have? A harem. They had lots of wives and concubines. And they had them all in a room with some eunuchs guarding them. What happened to Solomon? How many wives did he have? Way too many. I, mean, I love how, this is a, Dr. Machir, he says, in other words, the divine ideal of kingship had been corrupted and the holder of the office is inadequate. Women possibly refers to the royal harem, and if the king was a spoiled brat, then his wives were numerous and manipulative, fitting what we sense in the reign of Ahaz. The reference may be to be dominant and demanding women, but it's not really. It's the power behind the throne. It's, I think it's the harems uh, and also the influence that their mothers had on them. It's just that's what it is. And we don't see any of that in our culture today, right? Uh, anyway, so we come to a scene straight from the courtroom. Yahweh's the prosecutor. and He's the one asking the questions. These are the last three verses. The Lord arises to contend and stands to judge the people. The Lord enters into judgment with the elders and princes of his people. It's you who have devoured the vineyard. The plunder of the poor is in your houses. What do you mean by crushing my people and grinding the face of the poor, declares the Lord God of hosts. As we can tell from the situation so far in chapter 3, there's a deep concern on the part of the Lord, but he's thorough as a prosecutor. And the picture being drawn is applicable for Judah, but it may also be applicable universally the bottom line is, is which one do you follow? And when you're looking at the Old Testament, do you look at the Masoretic text or do you look at the Septuagint? Well, it depends upon the context of what you're, what you're reading. Is the context telling you this should be, in this case, it's a plural or a singular? Should it be a nation or nations? If it's nation, it's Judah. If it's nations, it's all of the nations of the world. And it, and it really is just nation because that's the context. The context is Judah. The cardinal rule, according to Dr. Heiser, is really simple. The best reading is the one that allows you to explain everything else that you've seen. It's the context that it's in. Sometimes you'll see a commentator say, well, I think it's this, but then you take a look at the context and you're going like, really? Or am I the only one that does that? But as it pertains to Scripture, context is always king. So we're, we look at this section of Isaiah 3 as directed towards Judah, not as some people say it would be directed to the Gentile nations. as well. It's not. This is for Judah. But again, as I've been saying, there's an awful lot of reflection of what's going on in Gentile nations, not just Judah. Yahweh is prepared to judge his people. He's prepared to judge Judah. 
And he presents his argument to the defendant table as he's pronouncing judgment on the leaders, and he differentiates between the elders and the princes. Verse 14, the Lord enters into judgment with the elders and princes of his people. It's you who have devoured the vineyard. The plunder of the poor is in your houses. The elders are the ones responsible for the welfare of the nation. These are the heads of houses and families. He went down to that level. He's talking to the heads of households that they're plundering. These are the ones that had been appointed in the wilderness to aid Moses. The princes are official government officials. These are the kings and the members of the king's family. So they're responsible for the welfare and administration of the government. So what he's basically saying is the entire structure of society from the government side and from the family side is in trouble and needs redemption. Based on that definition, he's not left out anybody. The condemnation is family leaders, fathers, grandfathers, priests, Levites, tribal leaders, military leaders, all the way up to the king and his court, anybody who's in leadership. And it says basically they're are they devouring, they're exterminating, feeding on, I love the other phrase, or they're just being stupid with. You, know, you can take that word any of those ways. But knowing that, we see that there's a clearer picture of the charge. They've burned up, they've exterminated and spoiled like animals and been stupid with the vineyard, and their vineyard is the nation. We'll get a picture of that in chapter 5. The specific charge leveled as to what the lead, how the leadership's doing this and how they're doing it by taking away from those who were supposed to be caring for, the poor, they're stealing from their neighbors, leads us into verse 15. Verse 15, what do you mean by crushing my people and grinding the face of the poor, declares the Lord God of hosts. And when he says grinding, it's like grinding into the ground. Okay, You grind the faces of the afflicted. Apparently the figure is that of a man who's fallen, prostrate, face in the dust, and somebody's just pushing him down constantly, not letting him get up. So what God is saying, the leadership, family leadership, as well as governmental leadership has done, is they've devoured, burned, exterminated, ruined, been stupid with, those who they've been charged to oversee and to, to lead, they've crushed them. In other words, they've defeated them to the point that they don't want to get up. They, they, you're just kind of, why should I bother? And then to the point that they're even grinding their face into the ground with it. And with that argument from Yahweh and the charges, we're going to stop. But the thing that strikes me looking through this and, and reading it is how similar it is to our culture. I mean, the one thing when I was learning and taking all these history courses was nothing really changes. It's the same stuff over and over again. And, the, and, and that's why Isaiah is so important. I call it the gospel of Isaiah too, by the way. He'll talk a lot about Jesus. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for the fact that you show up in the scriptures. Anytime we take a look at it, we start seeing you and we start seeing what it is that you want to do and how you, your grace still shows up. You're showing grace to the nation of Israel. You're showing Judah what they can do to, to not suffer judgment at, at your hands, yet they're going to continue to reject. We know that because we've looked at examples of it. Help us, Lord, not to be like Judah, but help us to be like those who repented and came back to you. Lord, give us soft hearts so that we can not yell at the culture around us, but talk to those who are being taken away by it and show them you and show them your love and show that you can fix anything and change anything, that, that they don't have to be slaves of the culture. Lord, that you're here to set all of us free and to be free indeed. Lord, guide us as we continue to go about sharing with those around us and give us your words so that we can have the same wisdom that Isaiah had as he was sharing your words to the people of Judah. Thank you, Lord, for the, your word. And we just ask that you continue to guide us this week. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Because you decided to stay tuned, you've just been a part of the Unsafe Bible with Pastor Ken Brown. Do you know how glad it makes our hearts to know you're investing time in your relationship with Jesus? So much. In fact, would you connect with us and share a little about what's been happening in your life and how this radio ministry has affected you? The unsafebible.com has a space for you to do just that. Go to the Connect tab at the side and then click on the Connect card. Once there, fill out the form and then we'll be sure to touch base with you. 
Pastor Ken's message from Isaiah today left me reflecting on my own life and how I treat people. Do I treat them how I want to be treated? Do I give them the cold shoulder when I feel like it? Or do I choose kindness over retaliation? Isaiah was one of the major prophets that confronted some of these common issues we still face today. You don't want to miss any of these teachings. Trust me. If you already have, don't sweat it. We have your bases covered. Just go to the unsafebible.com and click on Media. There you'll find this and other messages to listen to. If Go, Go, Go is your middle name and you can't seem to find a still moment, you can follow us via Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. We'd also like to personally invite you to attend one of our services. Find all the information you need, including directions at our website. And just in case you've forgotten, it's the unsafebible.com. We hope to meet you soon. That's it for today. Thanks for listening. Come back again for more of the Unsafe Bible.